can see it. Oh, I heard it. <laughs> Recording in progress. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can see your screen as well. Okay, cool. Um, let me try and make this big. Can you all see? Yep. Yep. Awesome. Okay, cool. So yeah, I'm Ashley. Thank you so much for the intro. Um, I'm super excited to be talking with y'all today about screen reader accessibility on iOS. So um, as Sierra mentioned, like, yeah, I've been working on um, accessibility on iOS for the past couple of months at my company. And it's something that I'm really interested in. I feel like more people should know more about, especially on mobile. So yeah, super excited to be here today. Um, I'm just going to go over a brief agenda of what we're going to cover. So firstly, we're just going to talk really broadly about like the importance of accessibility. Next, we're going to go on and we're going to do a voiceover demo and then also just talk about like, how screen readers actually work. Um, then we're going to talk about how to set accessibility labels, uh, talk about common accessibility label issues that crop up. And then finally, we're going to go over testing with voiceover and other tools. And then finally, like the challenges of mobile accessibility testing. So it's like quite a bit, but hopefully we can get it all in. Um, so firstly, I'm going to talk about the importance of mobile accessibility. So 26% uh, of US adults have a disability. I think that when we talk about accessibility, uh, people often say like, oh, it's a really small percentage of the user base that we actually have to, you know, think about when we're developing uh, apps and making them accessible, but it's just really not true. Um, like a quarter of US adults have a disability. Um, you can see that statistic for yourself. Um, another thing is like making apps more inclusive benefits everyone. So a really good example of this is speech to text. So this was originally, you know, invented for people who aren't able to use like a phone screen to text. But I know lots of people use it nowadays. Like I use it too. Sometimes when like my hands are really full and I just like click it on and it automatically converts my whole text, you know, speech into text. Um, so yeah, that's just like one very simple example for making out more inclusive benefits everyone. Um, another really important thing is the ADA. So it's the Americans with Disabilities Act. And often when you hear people talking about mobile accessibility, you might just hear it referred to as ADA. So if you hear that, that's what it is. Um, and it's, you know, basically a set of laws that requires mobile apps to be accessible. So like legal reasons, this is another good reason to ensure um, mobile accessibility. And then also, like I just want to talk about here as well, like there are obviously a range of different categories within accessibility. I'm going to be focusing on screen readers today because that's kind of what I've been working on. Um, but there are like many other aspects of accessibility to consider as well. Um, and also, I, I like firmly believe that accessibility should be built in at the design stage. I think too often you get to the end of like developing an app and um, that's when people start thinking about accessibility. And obviously, if you start at the design stage, you can you know, fix all of those errors that are coming up and not have it just be an afterthought and then have to fix a bunch of things in testing. Um, so yeah, just something to note. So next, we are going to talk about what is a screen reader. So a screen reader is an assistive technology that reads the app screen aloud. So it's slightly different on iOS and Android. So obviously today we're gonna to be talking about iOS and on iOS is called voiceover. And it's primarily used by users with uh, visual disabilities. They could be you know, partially blind, fully blind, any range in between there. Um, and the screen is read out loud from left to right and then top to bottom. So if you have like a basic app screen, I'm gonna show a demo in a bit, but um, it would read out every element left to right, top to bottom. And one quirk, I guess, of using voiceover is that you need a physical device to use it. So um, if you've used like a simulator before with Xcode, you can actually run voiceover on a simulator. You can use a different tool, which I will also talk about later, but you need a physical device to be able to turn on voiceover and then use it on the screen. Cool. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how voiceover <clears throat> actually works. So accessibility labels um, are like the number one thing that make voiceover work. So accessibility labels on elements um, are used by voiceover to read aloud the different screen elements. That's how it knows you know, what is on screen and what should be read out. So every relevant element on the screen must have an accessibility label. I'm going to talk 
later about like what a relevant ele element actually means. Um, but yeah, they must all have accessibility labels. Um, and a couple of common gestures. So you can swipe left and swipe right to navigate through different elements on the screen. Um, you can tap once to select an element. You can double tap to activate um, an element such as a button. Uh, there are a ton more gestures and I put like a whole list of uh, references at the end of the presentation and you can see it there like there's a whole list of different gestures but honestly I think the best way to kind of understand how voiceover works is just to enable it and use it yourself um, so yeah but these are just a couple of common gestures oh Okay, it's already autoplay. <laughs> um, okay, so now I'm going to do a little voiceover demo uh, with Spotify and I used Red Taylor's version because I love it. Um, so basically what I'm going to do or what I'm going to show you on this on this video is navigating through the different album tracks. I'm going to show you a couple of common issues that crop up um, and then I'm also going to briefly talk about uh, focus over here. So I'm just going to restart it. And as you can see, like this element here is highlighted. So voiceover is focused currently on the back button, which you would expect because it's the top um, left side of the screen. So I'm going to go ahead and play and you'll hear it say like back button and then I'll read out like red Taylor's version. Um, and hopefully y'all can hear this actually. Yeah, let me know if you, if you can't hear it. Um, Can y'all hear that? Um, if there's volume right now, we cannot. Okay, there's not. Okay. Um, how do I um, oh, wait, share? So if you, now? yeah. Okay. What about now? Well, let me play it. Red Taylor's yes. version. We can. Okay. Hear it cool. Now. Awesome. Okay, so I'll just restart it so y'all can hear it. Back button. Red. Taylor's version. Album. 2021. Taylor Swift. Heading. Cool. Okay. So as you like saw, it went from the back button and then it went to this whole section, which has like red Taylor's version. One thing that's kind of unexpected here is that it goes to album 2021 instead of reading Taylor Swift right after it. So that is something to do with focus order. Um, so focus order essentially means that everything is being read out on the screen as you would expect left to right, top to bottom. Um, but this could have just been like a design choice that they made. Maybe they thought like, I want to read out the album 2021 first and then read out the artist's name. Um, and then you'll see next, it actually navigates to the play button here instead of going to the like button, which you would, I think you would probably expect it to go next to like and then all the way over to play. Um, but again, I guess the play button is more like it's it's more often used. So it does kind of make sense why I would navigate to that next. Um, but I'm just going to play it so y'all can hear it. Play button. Like button. Adds the album to your library. OK, so right here, if you heard it, it said like like and then adds the album to your library. That's an example of an accessibility hint, which I'm also gonna talk about later. Um, but essentially the like button is the actual accessibility label. And then the accessibility hint is telling you what actually happens when you click on that button. Um, sometimes with accessibility hints in particular, like people can add too many of them and then it just adds a lot of clutter to the screen. But in this case, I think it is really useful because it says, you know, like button, it doesn't really tell you what it's going to do. Like, is it going to like the album? Is it going to like the song or whatever? Um, so it's good that it tells you, like, adds the album to your library. That's pretty helpful. Um, and then it's going to navigate through to the other button. So I'll just let it play out so y'all can hear it. Download button. Currently not downloaded. Tap to download and make available offline. More options button. State of Grace, Taylor's version, Taylor Swift, button. Actions available. Red, Taylor's version, Taylor Swift, button. Actions available. Okay, so that's when I had like double tap to activate that so that you can play the song, but um, all the rest of the actions, I was just swiping right, which moves you from element to element. 
Um, so yeah, that's just like a very basic example of how voiceover works. I'm gonna do more like demos later on as well to display some of the issues that do come up. Um, also just something to note here is, I don't know if you noticed, but at the very beginning, there was no description for the album cover. Um, I'm gonna talk about that later, but just something to note. Um, Cool. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about how to actually set an accessibility label. So when you have elements that have text, you're automatically going to have an accessibility label inferred um, by iOS. So it's really nice that they automatically do that. Um, but a couple of elements that won't have it inferred are switches, images, and image buttons, and a couple of other things as well. Um, so for those things, you have to go in and you have to manually set the accessibility labels. So this is just a little bit of um, information about how to set it for each different thing. So like on UI kit, you do this with the accessibility label, you just play on Swift UI, which I really haven't used that much. This is how you set it. And then for interface builder, you can just go here and you can set the label this way. And accessibility does need to be enabled, like the check needs to be there um, in order for voiceover to properly pick it up. Um, and then next, I'm going to talk about some guidelines for setting accessibility labels. So a couple of things to note when you're setting accessibility labels, you don't want to add like an action verb or an element type. So for example, you don't want to write like cancel button for an actual button because voice or iOS will already know that that's a button. So then it would be that like cancel button button. So you don't need to put that. You can just put cancel. Um, and then iOS will know what to read out afterwards as like the action verb. Um, another thing to know, the accessibility hint adds more information about what happens when the element is selected. That's what I was showing previously with the like button. Um, and again, yeah, you kind of have to be careful there and not use it too often because um, yeah, accessibility hints can like kind of crowd the screen as well. Um, and then also not everything actually needs an accessibility label. So there can be things like decorative images that don't add any value. So basically you should think about it like if I removed this image from the screen and everything still made sense and it doesn't add any value whatsoever to understanding the screen, then it doesn't really need an accessibility label. Um, yeah, so just another thing to know. And then, okay, so Cue. now- Lyrics. Okay. Um, another thing I'm going to talk about are common accessibility label issues. So like I mentioned before, images like image buttons, they don't have um, these text values automatically inferred. So you need to set them yourself. So that's like I see it most commonly with images and um, image buttons. Like, for example, if you have a Twitter logo button, and you don't have anything anywhere close to it that says like Twitter and you just have the logo, then you know, when voiceover goes over it, it's not gonna know what to what to click. It's just gonna say like button, um, which is obviously very unhelpful for a user um, who's using a screen reader. You can also run into it, some issues with like custom views and nested elements. Nested elements, it's usually more of a problem with uh, focus order. So for example, when you're swiping through with voiceover and you get caught in like a nest of elements, then it won't know how to escape. So that's more of an issue with um, focus order than it is with accessibility labels, but it's also good to mention because it does come up when you use a screen reader. Um, and then also with logos, this is like optional. Sometimes you don't need an accessibility label because if you have the logo and the logo is actually just text um, and then directly next to it, you actually have the name of the company or whatever it is then you know you don't need it twice because it doesn't make sense there um and it would just be a bit repetitive but sometimes you do need it like i mentioned before if you have like a twitter logo and nothing else um obviously you need it to say like twitter button or something like that um so i'm going to show an example here of the i think this is the image yeah the the album image not coming up properly so i'm just going to skip a bit to yeah. Okay. So basically what I'm doing is like, I'm expanding the lyrics uh, section here and I'm going over trying to see if I can hover over the image here, like the picture of Taylor, like in the car or whatever. Um, Red, Taylor's version. Red, 
Taylor. So if you heard that like hollow noise, that basically means that I'm swiping left and I'm trying to navigate to the image, but there's nothing else on the screen that voiceover picks up. So that's like basically the, I think they set the image to not be an accessibility element so that you can't access it. Um, maybe they thought that like, it's not that relevant. In my opinion, I think the album cover of a, of a song or an album is like really um, important. I think that it adds like a lot of value, but I guess one thing that I was thinking about is that um, it might be really difficult to go through and have like, I don't even know how many albums they must have, like probably thousands, hundreds of thousands. I don't know if that's right. Um, but anyways, they could probably use something like, I don't know, image recognition or something like that to set an accessibility label. Maybe it wouldn't be perfect, but it would provide a little bit more insight. Um, but that's kind of a tangent, but just something I was thinking about because there is no uh, accessibility label for this image. So nothing is actually read out. So as you can see, I'm gonna like navigate right. First version. Just Close. to show y'all. Button. Taylor Swift. Loving him is like driving a new Maserati. It's so funny to hear the lyrics start out like that. Um, but yeah, basically, um, if you if you're going left and you're like not finding any anything more, it means that probably the accessibility um, element has been disabled. So it's not like his accessibility element um, anymore. So yeah, it's just like helpful of like the common accessibility label issues that come up. And then I also want to talk about making descriptive accessibility labels. So here, this is like the search section of Spotify. And as you go through, it'll say like search, and then you can like search with uh, voice activation as well. Um, but the camera icon says something a bit different, which is a little bit confusing. Um, so I'll just play it through so that y'all can hear it. Search, heading, open voice search button open camera button alert okay so as you can see it just says like open camera button and i think that is a little bit confusing and like somewhere where an accessibility hint could be really useful because it doesn't really indicate what the camera is going to be used for so after i went through after this i like went through and enabled you know access and all this stuff and it does say eventually that it will be used for spotify scan code um but i yeah this is somewhere where i think an accessibility hit would be super useful to say like open camera button and like something about spotify scan code um but this is just like a point of making sure that you're writing descriptive accessibility labels that make sense and they add value to what's actually going on on the screen. Okay, cool. So now I want to talk a little bit about how you can start testing with voiceover. So at the like the first demo I showed, I showed like how to en enable uh, voiceover, but you basically just go to your settings, you go to accessibility, and you double tap uh, to enable voiceover. Um, then you can switch back over to your app and you can just navigate through uh, starting at the top left corner by swiping right. And you should ask yourself a couple of questions as you're going through. So you should say like, does the order in which elements are re uh, read out make sense? Um, are you going like, like left to right, top to bottom? Um, does every relevant element on the screen have an accessibility label? Again, like those decorative images probably don't need them, but um, are really big things on the screen missing accessibility labels. So you need to go back and fix those. Um, is there anything read out by voiceover that's confusing? Sometimes buttons and things can have accessibility labels, but maybe because they're inferred, they're not quite right. And so they need to be fixed. Um, sometimes there are issues with like numbers and things like that being read out in a confusing way. Um, so something to look out for too. And then also does voiceover get stuck anywhere in the app? Again, a bit more about focus order rather than accessibility labels. But yeah, basically just wanna make sure that you, when you're navigating through voiceover, it's it's easy to do so. And um, you're not getting stuck somewhere in the app and not being able to get back out using voiceover. So the next step I would say after you go through your app while looking at it and swiping right and making sure everything makes sense is to enable screen curtain, which I'm gonna talk about on the next slide and test again without looking at the screen. 
Okay, so screen curtain, I'm gonna talk about for a second here. Um, essentially, it is a tool that people can use when they're using VoiceOver. So VoiceOver has to be enabled to use screen curtain and it turns off the display for added privacy. So you triple tap the screen with three fingers and then it turns the screen completely black. Um, and it's really good for users who are using VoiceOver and for example, they could be looking at like bank details or something like that, where they don't want the display to be on. Um, it's also a really good way for developers to test app interaction because you're interacting with the device. Um, I mean, in this case, with, as someone who would be like fully blind, um, but it's a good way for you to like go through your app and kind of understand um, does the app flow make sense while the screen is completely off and you can't see it at all. Um, another really helpful tool in Xcode is the accessibility inspector. So it inspects like different elements accessibility traits. So you can see like what the accessibility label and hint and such probably will be. It's not a substitute for um, actually testing using VoiceOver, but it is a really helpful tool um, while you're developing. And then finally, there is the GSCX scanner by Google. And this one does a lot of different things. So it scans the app for a range of accessibility issues. So not just are there accessibility labels present, um, are touch target sizes correct? So for example, um, one of the guidelines that's out there uh, says that you know you can't have buttons that are too small because it's difficult to touch them, like the, the target size is too small basically. Um, it'll also return information about like uh, color contrast, are your, are your colors like okay for people who are colorblind, things like that. Um, and it also lets you add your own checks. But I would say if you are just looking to check for the most basic level, which is like checking for accessibility labels, it might oh, like return too much information. It might be a little bit overwhelming. But if you are looking to do like a comprehensive scan of your app, then it is put quite helpful, you know, and you can, it basically overlays onto your app screen and it'll tell you like everything that is wrong with your app or is not like accessibility compliant. Okay, cool. So I just wanted to do a little demo here of how to use the accessibility inspector. So again, in Xcode, it's like in the developer tools. Um, and then you have to click on your simulator here from like all processes. And basically what you can do is you can click over and see it says like pick a poem button so it's telling you like what will likely be the accessibility label so that's just pretty helpful if you don't have like a physical iphone and you can't use voiceover um the accessibility inspector is definitely really helpful okay i also wanted to talk a little bit about the challenges of mobile accessibility testing so one thing i think with accessibility in general is it's kind of difficult to automate there's a lot of nuance in like accessibility testing in general like talking about what is valid so is having any accessibility label at all an acceptable criteria or do we want to make sure that the accessibility label actually makes sense um and how exactly would you test for that like how would you test that it makes sense um, also difficult to check for focus order because you need to know the order of the elements, like what order should the elements actually be in. First of all, you have to know that and you have to note it down in order to properly test that voiceover is scanning through uh, properly. It's also pretty time consuming, I would just say because you can't actually automate it too, too well. Um, you have to have a developer or somebody else be there and say like, is this valid? Is this acceptable? Um, and then fix it if it's not, or just go ahead and accept it. Um, I would also say that there's not a lot of tools out there for mobile accessibility testing. When I had to do a lot of research and um, figure out what was out there, there's uh, like shockingly <laughs> not that many um, tools out there. So I think because there aren't that many like, automated things, um, people just don't do it, which obviously is not great. Um, but yeah, these are just like a couple of challenges that cropped up as well when I was doing um, mobile accessibility testing. Okay, and then finally, I want to do a little recap. So the most important thing is that accessibility labels must be present for every element on the screen. That's the biggest takeaway. Um, also, 
the labels are inferred from elements with text, but other things like switches and images and image buttons don't have default labels. So you do have to go in and you have to set them yourself. Um, accessibility labels should be short and descriptive. You don't want to put like way too much information because like I said, it can kind of be an overload. Um, and yeah, you just want to make it as like navigable as possible, um, like as easy as possible. Um, while also being very descriptive of what's going on on the screen. And then, yep, finally, just like making your app more accessible benefits everyone and it improves user experience across the board. So it's definitely worth it to um, keep in mind and make sure that you're making it a priority as you're going through and you're building your app, you're testing your app, whatever it is. Um, so yeah, I think that's everything I have for today. If y'all have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And then also this is my Instagram and my YouTube channel, my sister, so yeah. We have so many good questions. Um, first, I just wanna say that was a great presentation and I love the demos. I thought that was so helpful. Um, and so I'm just gonna jump into these questions. Um, so uh, let's get started with the first one. Um, I'll just try to do them order and accessibility need to change based on the device. Um, for example, iPhone SE versus an iPhone 13 Pro Max. Yeah, so it shouldn't um, because you have like the built-in elements from iOS. Um, yeah, it shouldn't have to change. Like I've done testing across and it, it basically stays the same. As long as you have the accessibility labels present, it won't be a problem. As a person who does not need accessibility options like voiceover, what's the best way you found to design for accessibility? Designing for something you don't need or use? Yeah, a really good question. Um, I think it's obviously really important to do a lot of research at the beginning because um, like you said, like you don't need the accessibility options yourself, um, but it is very important to design for it. Um, so yeah, do a lot of research. I think it's also actually really helpful to talk to people who've worked in the field for a long time. So I, I like spoke with people who worked in the field, also people who had friends and things like that who used screen reader really often. And so they knew like their experience from that as well. Um, so I think that's really helpful too. Um, and then, yeah, just in terms of designing and things like that, um, I don't know, just like a lot of, I think a lot of research is what's really important. I did so much research before <laughs> I started working in this area. Yeah, um, I feel like a follow-up question that Erica just posted that kind of goes with that is, do you have good resources for folks who want to get started in this area and don't have very much experience? I know you shared a slide of resources as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a lot like here. This is like a whole. And yeah. um, if, if it's okay with you, I, I know that you sent me these slides um, earlier mm -hmm. uh, this yeah. weekend. So I can also share those in our Slack as well so that folks can directly access these resources. As well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I like made a couple of changes, so I'll send you an updated. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. Erica's in our Slack, so she can get those. Yeah, well. yeah. I think these are all really helpful. And then also, like I said, like honestly, just going through with voiceover on a device makes such a difference because you really do understand like what it's like to navigate through your app using you know, voiceover. Um, you talked a little bit about um accessibility hints on iOS. Um, and we had a mm -hmm. question, can we modify the accessibility hint to shorten it for subsequent clicks so that it doesn't read out loud the hint every time, like with the like or download button? Um, I don't, I think you have to like, wait, sorry, can you read it one more time? <laughs> yeah, um, can we modify the accessibility hint to shorten it for subsequent hints? I think her question is, um, I, it's the same thing on iOS and Android is those button clicks have really, really long yeah. accessibility hints because they read the hint and then they tell you like double click to activate um, or whatever mm -hmm. it is on iOS. I have the Android mm -hmm. one memorized. Um, <laughs> and does it, does it, is there a way to avoid reading that whole thing or what is the best practice there? I don't think there is. I don't know. On Android, is there a way? I was going to ask uh, you. So on Android, in Jetpack and Pose. So only very recently, we have been able to add a specific action to make it more meaningful. Um, oh, before okay. it was always double click to activate. Now I think you can do um, an action label that would be double click to navigate to settings or whatever you can oh. type, you can change that. But I don't think that mm -hmm. there's a way to get rid of all of it. 
And I think yeah. the best practice is, in my understanding has always been consistency. And so you don't want to yeah. change it is yeah. it, they know how to use that framework. They know how to use it really well. They can just yeah. skip over and they'll stop reading it if they don't need to hear the full thing every time. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I think it is still double talk to activate because that's what I've heard as I've been going through and testing myself. Um, but yeah, also, that's a really good point because, yeah, you don't want to like customize too much because when you run into like, if you start customizing things, it can make it really confusing for a user to go through. So yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. <laughs> um, can the user turn on and off having accessibility, re having voiceover read accessibility hints? So that's, that's actually seems very close to being related to the last question. <laughs> yeah, I think, I don't know. I don't, I don't think. Obviously you can go in and you can like edit the accessibility hint yourself if you want to have it like be more short or whatever. Um, but honestly, I would say like people, it's not too often that you see accessibility hints. It, like at least when I've been testing, I don't see too many of them. Um, do you have any tips for on ensuring that the context, I think this is missing, not. Um, do you have any tips on ensuring that the context is not lost when the user navigated to a new screen or is in a, section the hints um, could help remind or reinforce where the where in the app the user is and also you have access to these q a if i yeah <laughs> no you're good well, that's great yeah it's good it's like i'm like listening to you and reading it as well um yeah no uh so any tips on sure that it's not lost when you update to new screen so when you're in like a section or a group with several elements, iOS should automatically infer. So like it'll read out, for example, like element two of seven or whatever it is. So you don't have to put that yourself. Um, and then when you're navigating to a new screen, I mean, you should have like, it'll tell you like this, the header or whatever of like the new screen. And so you shouldn't have to add anything extra that'll say like a new screen or something like that. Cause that could probably just make it confusing and it's just extra work and I don't think it's necessary. Yeah, that's a good answer as well. Um, can you use UI testing to automate mobile accessibility testing? Yeah, so you can use bits. So there's like XCUI, which you can use. Um, I should add, I'll add something to the resources. Like I can think of a page that's super helpful for this. Um, but you can, I don't know if that's like completely automated though. You can use like UI testing to test for accessibility, but automation is a little tricky there. Because of all the um, I actually want to follow up on that is because this came up in one of our our meetings recently at work is mm -hmm. on on Android. Um, I have lots of Android two iOS questions. <laughs> is we have we have we have a UI testing framework called Espresso. Um, that yeah. that's what you write your UI tests and in like the initialization of your test, you can add this accessibility checks not enabled mm -hmm. function call. And so mm -hmm. when you add that to like the initialization of that uh, UI test, it will then go through and as it hits elements in that UI test, as it like moves through, it will check mm -hmm. for common pitfalls automatically. Um, like, mm -hmm. does it have a content description? Do you meet or your color contrast? So never mm -hmm. recommend it should be your only UI, only accessibility testing, but a super useful tool to have in your toolbox to kind of even help get you start it to like call out things you're missing in your application. Is there an equivalent on iOS that you can just like set up and run? I don't think there is, no. I feel like that would have been super helpful if there was, um, yeah. unless I just totally missed it. But like, I, I was gonna also say when I read that question again, like UI testing um, for, for accessibility, um, one thing is that sometimes when you are just writing like normal tests, you'll access elements by like the accessibility label. And so that's how you're like identifying. So I guess in that sense, you are technically doing like accessibility testing because you're finding elements based on their label. If the label's wrong, it's not gonna, you know, get it back for you. Um, but yeah, no, I don't think there is that. That'd be really cool though. Unless I just missed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious how, how to deal with voiceover for private details like passwords, security questions, or their account balance. Um, can we warn the user that sensitive data is about to be read out loud? That's a great question as well. Yeah, that is a great question. I don't know. Um, I, I, I really don't know, actually. 100% do not know. I feel like there must be, though, because if you think about like bank details being read out loud, it probably is going to say something like password or something like that. Um, that's, you know, that's a good question. Yeah, that is a great question. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, is it possible to have accessibility features voiceover for games um, where things are moving consistently? Also, great yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is a great question. Um, okay, so again, I'm not really 100% sure, but I will say that when I was testing with the lyrics, for example, on Spotify, and you know how the lyrics are like going as the song progresses or whatever, it did not do a good job because it was like catching and then it was like, it wouldn't even finish saying like all the lyrics and then it would like go to the next one and then go to the next one. So I think it'd probably be, it'd probably be quite difficult, but I'm sure there are ways to do it. Um, oh, that's like a very interesting, I guess, topic is like game accessibility as well. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. That is a really good question. Yeah. Um, I, I was actually looking into this on the Android side recently and I don't know how this would scale to in a game that Mm -hmm. That is a much bigger question than what I was trying to look into is that Android has like a, an accessibility, and I actually only know this in Jetpack and Post, I have not looked at it in XML, is has a tag for like live regions. And so mm -hmm. if you like mark a certain region as a live region, that will like read consistently as oh. whatever, whatever is in that is changing. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. something like a, a timer would be something you might yeah. want to consider using like that live region for to count down to zero or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I can imagine, yeah, if that'd be really, like, it'd be hard if you have multiple different things, like, moving in the same space, you know what I mean? Because I'm like, how are you going to read out? Like, in what order would you read out, you know, what's happening in this game? Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> I love some of the chat that's happening in our chat is, Mahila said she just checked her Chase app, and it did straight up read out her balance and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think most people, when they're using it, I think would like probably be when they're doing like banking and stuff like that probably use headphones or something like that yeah so, yeah and also i just think even with normal things like you wouldn't want your messages read out loud if you're like in a right or something like that yeah <laughs> yeah i don't want anyone to hear my message <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh and Navadi also added that she heard about this game that has um american sign language for a game which is really cool mm, that is super cool I've, I've actually heard a little bit about like vr accessibility just because i know like a woman who does that um but yeah that is really cool yeah i feel like ar accessibility is going to have a really big topic with like mm -hmm. the way the metaverse is being <laughs> right now I feel really silly saying that out loud. <laughs> but it does like start to beg these questions that we've like seen a lot of companies like really pushing these kind of argument and realities is that we have to have those kind of conversations in a way that we never have before. Yeah, that is super true. Um, out of those AX tools that you presented, which one is your favorite and why? Um, which one would you use for your projects? So, I mean, I've actually been working on like a, like, creating a tool myself to be honest because none of them were exactly great <laughs> um but i will say like if you're just getting started out and you want to do a comprehensive scan of everything i think the google scanner is a good place to start it's pretty easy to set up as well and you just like overlay it tells you everything that's wrong <laughs> basically with your app regarding accessibility um and then yeah like i said voiceover it's just a really great one to go through um if you have an iphone though as well so I mean, I don't know. Everyone that develops on iOS doesn't necessarily have an iPhone. Like I have an Android myself. So <laughs> I had to like get an iPhone to be able to test with voiceover. Yeah. That's so fun. I have an iPhone and I'm an Android engineer. <laughs> <laughs> it was my place. <laughs> um, does testing accessibility via Xcode give you the same result or expectation compared to testing via an actual device? Like, can I just test 100% via Xcode without having to test on an actual device? Um, yeah, so you you can't because, yeah, it, it is different. So for example, like with focus order, you can't really get the same experience as, as going with voiceover. Um, yeah, I don't know. This was a really big challenge for me because you can only do voiceover on a physical iPhone. Um, but like I said, the accessibility inspector is super helpful if you just want to go through and see like, what will probably be read out. These are some excellent questions. Some of them are no, they're so good. really good, really thoughtful. I, I really appreciate that. I just want to shout out all of our attendees for thinking of some <laughs> excellent questions throughout that presentation. Um, does anyone have any last minute burning questions for Ashley before we wrap up for today? Um, I, again, just want to thank you so much, Ashley. Such a great presentation. And I think that was, that really showed with these questions that came out of it. It was well yeah, presented. And 
really opened the door to building accessible, starting to get, get starting with accessibility on iOS. Yeah, thank you so much. I really enjoyed being this talk. And yeah, thank you all for so many good questions. It's great, <laughs> challenging. Um, I will share the slides um, in our Slack. And um, thank you all so much for attending. I hope to see you in our Slack as well in between this and our next event. I do recommend you go and check out our upcoming events on our webpage, womenhoco.com slash mobile. With that, I just hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Hope to see you at the next one. Thank you. <laughs>